Hi everyone, I'm Candice. I am a resident and R2 at Mount Sinai, Miami, and I'm here with Dr. Joshua Unger. He is one of our new vascular surgery attendings. He recently completed vascular surgery fellowship at Duke, previously being in general surgery residency at UNC Chapel Hill, and he does a lot of endovascular intervention. So he's going to walk us through fistula creation and also management, clinical management, uh, follow-up, and endovascular intervention. So thanks for joining. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really nice to be here. It's an honor to be asked to do this. So um, I hope you guys enjoy this talk. Can, is it showing up now? It's, okay, here we go. Yep. All right, great. Uh, so thanks to the Society of Interventional Radiology. Um, these are my disclosures. Uh, I'm a young attending. It's my first year of being an attending, so my recommendations take them for what they're worth. Other than that, no company involvements or anything. Uh, here's our hospital, uh, Mount Sinai Medical Center in Miami Beach, Florida. Miami Beach is where I grew up, so I came back home to practice. Uh, there are almost 700 beds in our hospital, and they call us a large, private, independent, not-for-profit teaching hospital in South Florida. And I, you know, I guess that's because. I guess we don't meet any one of the, we're not the largest hospital in South Florida. We're not the most independent, you know, so that's us. And this is our, um, can you, does the uh, mouse show up here like that? Oh, no, right there, okay. This, uh, this is where our hospital is located right here, and you can see this is Greater Miami, so we have this large in, uh, area of uh, clinical uh, patients that we see. So it goes all the way up to Flor Fort Lauderdale up here, so. Uh, and here's my practice. I trained uh, for five years in general surgery, two years in vascular surgery, and I, I do um, about two-thirds vascular surgery, and I take general surgery call here. Here's an article of my family. Um, my grandfather and my father were our surgeons. My dad is still practicing. My grandfather is retired, um, and uh, I joined my dad's practice. Now, he's uh, one of the few people in uh, Miami Beach, who really focuses on dialysis access. So um, I've had a lot of back and forth with my dad, who has more, over 30 years of experience doing this. And so a lot of times he does a fistula, and if there's something wrong with the fistula, uh, he, he sends it to me, and I'll, I'll do an endovascular intervention. We figure out what, what's going on and, and address it. Um, so my practice, about 25% uh, dialysis access, probably 20% overall of his endovascular uh, of that, of the so 5% of that would be fistula creation. Um, and we work mostly in the in a lab where there's about seven interventional suites. One of them has a hybrid OR, and it's a mixing pot with interventional radiology, neurointerventional radiology, and, and cardiology. So, and then I'm like the only vascular surgeon that I know of who works in this cath lab, so it, it's still a uh, work in progress. Um, and then here's the talk on, on um, fistulas and dialysis access. Uh, 400,000 patients uh, in the U.S. on hemodialysis, and that's growing rapidly. Um, since 1972, when anybody who was on hemodialysis could qualify for Medicare, uh, and it costs a lot, $3 billion cost for just placing and maintaining AV access. Um, and they say that for patients with end-stage renal disease, the leading cause of hospitalization is AV access dysfunction. So it seems to me that uh, if we could try to prevent some of that, getting them functioning pretty well and keeping them out of the hospital, save the taxpayers dollars. Um, here's the history of dialysis, brief history, because these always get mentioned in every, every talk on fistulas and, and, and dialysis. Uh, William Kof uh, was uh, a doctor and sort of like an engineer in the in uh, the Netherlands during Nazi occupation, and he in, invented a uh, dialysis machine, which you can see here, which he made out of uh, sausage casings as the filtrate, uh, and uh, used uh, washing machine parts to make this. Uh, and, and he did start giving dialysis in 1942, but it didn't actually work until two years later. Then this is also um, the origins of, uh, they used to have to expose the artery and vein for every session. But in the 1960s, uh, the head of nephrology, Schreibner, or Scrib, Scrib I, th I think is how they say it, uh, and Quinton, who we all know from uh, Quinton catheters, uh, worked together uh, to create this Schreibner shunt, which connected an artery and vein, which was created surgically, but then was allowed to, 
to uh, the, they would connect to the dialysis machine, then connect it to it itself, so the blood would be flowing from the artery to the vein when it wasn't connected to the dialysis machine. Um, and that worked pretty well, but these always ended up with infections, as you can imagine. Uh, and then in 1966, uh, Bressio and Samina, Samino, who were two nephrologists, convinced Dr. A Apple in uh, the Bronx, Apple's the surgeon, uh, to create a first fistula. And they, the, here's their first article, which is in uh, New England Journal of Medicine in 1966, which shows they exposed a artery and a neighboring vein connected the two, and that was the fistula. Should we place fistulas or should we place grafts? Um, the, uh, you know, if anybody's familiar with the Fistula First Initiative, the, and, and my philosophy and my dad's philosophy is to, is to create fistulas in everybody because they're, it's made out of the patient's own uh, body material and is more resistant to infection. A lot of times grafts uh, work, but um, you know it's an artificial implantation of something in the in the body, and uh, they don't always work reliably. Uh, but you know if you thought about the arguments for each, um, if you place a fish, it takes about two to three months before they mature enough to be able to use for dialysis, and it takes. Only, but if you place a graft, it would take only two to three weeks, and you can use it because you have to wait for it to get incorporated into the uh, surrounding tissues, so that when they stick a needle in and pull it out it doesn't create a pseudoaneurysm between the uh, graft and the surrounding tissues. Um, and, you know, if you place a fistula, they say only 50% of fistulas mature overall. Uh, however, uh, fistulas have a much decreased <coughs> incidence and risk of infection. And at uh, a year and a half, much more, if the fistula has mature, the majority of them stay open compared to grafts, of which half of them are not. Um, function 18 months. And somebody who's relegated to grafts will go from graft to graft to graft until they run out of spots and uh, that's it. And uh, this is a graph right here uh, from uh, a meta-analysis of all the fishes which gave, which gave this patency results here. And uh, this is uh, primary patency, secondary patency, uh, primary patency and secondary patency of uh, fistulas. Okay, and then this is what I was talking about, the Fischler First Initiative. The National Kidney Foundation, uh, KDOKI, uh, is um, an initiative that started in the early 2000s, uh, really saying that they should, uh, we should be increasing our rate of fistulas uh, for the same arguments I just said, uh, called the Fischler First Strategy. And in May 2003, uh, there was 32% of patients on dialysis with fistulas. That was improved to 50% in 2009. But that is not the goal. In 2001, they set the goal for, for 2009 as being two-thirds of the patient age fistulas. We haven't met that, but uh, the, at least making progress. And then just a little about hemodialysis. Uh, in order to actually get hemodialysis, um, patients have to be connected uh, to uh, the machine, and they use 15 to 17 gauge needles uh, and access the fistula or the graft. Um, and you can see here that the one that's farther away from the patient's heart is usually the one that uh, is, takes blood out of the patient, uh, goes through the machine, gets cleaned, and then is, re is returned back to the, to the patient in the venous. And so uh, these flow at about 300 milliliters per minute to 400 milliliters per minute. So you're taking that much out and you're throwing it back into the patient. You need to have a wide patent. Uh, uh, fish lower graft. Um, and here's our machine. Uh, I took a picture of this yesterday. Um, this is uh, uh, the settings here. And the, the main settings I wanted to pay attention to, and if, if somebody uh, decides to become uh, a dialysis access person, they really need to talk to the uh, techs who are running it, and they'll say there's a problem with the fish line. You, and if you engage them and say, what what readings were you getting when you're having a problem? You can give you a hint as to what the problem is and let you just understand the, the physiology a little better. Here's the uh, rate at which the machine is running. It's running at 380 milliliters per minute. Uh, and the arterial pressure is negative as, because it's sucking the blood out. You can see that right here in the schematic here. Um, and, and you always want this to be a negative number. And the uh, pressure number um, 
is a venous pressure. Now, if somebody has central venous stenosis, for example, this venous pressure number tends to go up over time, and that can be a hint. Another problem that you can see here is recirculation. If you have two needles that are put too close together, the, this needle is pulling out uh, blood, this needle is pushing it back, and if it doesn't go to the heart and goes backwards, you'll start getting positive pressures on the arterial pressure. Uh, and so that can say, oh, we have recirculation. So those are some of the uh, hints about how that works. Here's the outline. I'll talk about surgical creation of fistulas and endovascular interventions. And I have put a lot of angiograms in there. So hopefully everybody will like that. Uh, all right. Here's, there's many different types of locations uh, for where you put a fistula. Uh, and this is just going to be uh, four or five slides on the type, how to do it, the size of the arteries and veins and that kind of thing. But just to categorize them, the farthest away from the heart and closest to the heart. The first one you would start with is a radiocephalic snuffbox fistula. I've never seen this one. Uh, I've never seen somebody with a scar with this. I've never seen this operation performed, but it's described. The next one is a radiocephalic fistula. Uh, and here's the radial artery right here and the cephalic vein, which are nearby, so you can make one incision, expose the two of them. And sometimes you do it right at the wrist. Sometimes you can do it in the forearm. Um, Sometimes you can even do it up here. It just depends on the size of the uh, vein, um, if, you, if the vein is adequate enough. Uh, the, these have the lowest rate of maturation. Uh, understandably, it's usually smaller veins. And if you take the blood supply, which starts at the bacilli, um, brachial, and then divides into two, you have less of a blood supply feeding the fistula. So they tend to not mature as well overall compared to higher up. Um, there's another one that's described as taking the basilic vein, uh, making a big incision here, transposing it, and bringing it over the radial artery. These don't work very well. Um, the uh, act of, tr of uh, dissecting out what is a small vein in the forearm doesn't usually work uh, that great. Um, but it, it is an option. Um, the next one is a brachiocephalic fistula. And this is probably uh, one of this is probably the most common one I think, um, uh, which is taking the cephalic vein, making an incision on the antecubital fossa, bring it over to the uh, brachial artery. Um, and this is a brachial basilic. The basilic vein uh, is always on the medial aspect of the arm and is usually deep so that uh, it's usually untouched. So you, know, you, can usually, you can sometimes see cephalics in patients and they're all beat up from people of drawing blood and starting IVs. But the basilic vein is the hidden vein uh, and um, it can often be untouched in patients. So um, it's connected. Now there's a controversy here whether you should make a big incision along the arm, dissect the basilic vein out, mobilize it, because it's, it's very deep, so you have to mobilize it and make it superficial in order to get it to work, and then connect it to the brachial artery, and then wait to see if it matures. But the problem that people have shown is that um, that's not the greatest strategy, some people would argue, because you don't want to put somebody through a huge operation and then have it not work. So we've, we've adopted a strategy of making a small incision down at the, at the uh, distal uh, upper arm, uh, connecting them to waiting six weeks and then bring, coming back and then superficializing the uh, vein. Um, and then what do you do if none of these traditional veins work? It's not described that much, but a brachial, brachial upper arm fistula, next to the brachial artery, there's always two ar uh, veins running next to it. And if you pick the bigger one, connect it to the artery, wait six weeks, and superficialize it, that's often a um, uh, a way of making an autogenous dialysis access in patients who, uh, at least in our group, that's our philosophy is to try to do that instead of relegating them to a graft because uh, we try to do fistula first. There are also some obscure leg fistulas taking the femoral vein. Uh, and everybody should know that this, this used to be called the superficial femoral vein, but now it's called the femoral vein. Um, and the same thing, same argument as a basilic vein uh, is that this is very deep, so you would have to make a big incision, superficialize it. So, uh, this is described, I've not seen it. Uh, I've seen this one, which is a, taking the saphenous vein, dissecting it all out, and making a loop, connecting it to the femoral vein. This doesn't work that great be, um, from what people describe and what I've seen is because the saphenous vein is usually three to four millimeters and doesn't dilate that much. Um, so 
we'll talk about the size of the veins that you need to have a fistula work in uh, later, but just remember three to four millimeters is sometimes hard to, to stick. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, venograms. So um, in interventional radiology, you might get referred to patients say, I want a preoperative venogram for uh, fistula creation. Uh, or uh, an ultrasound uh, might be ordered to analyze the patient. We've adopted the strategy in the group of doing our own venograms at the time of surgery. So we, it's kind of annoying because you can send the patient for left, possible right, venogram, fistula versus graft, we don't know. But, uh, you know, we do it, and, and in combination with a bedside ultra, uh, intraoperative ultrasound and venogram, you can usually get a lot of information uh, about it. And this is just one uh, that shows both a, a basilic and a cephalic, uh, and this is patent centrally. You need to make sure that the central veins are patent as well, because um, if they're not, you run the risk of swelling uh, from connecting a, an adequate vein, but then not having anywhere for the blood to flow, so the arm would swell up. Uh, and uh, my mentor, my dad, says that having valves that you, you can see on veins is a good prognostic indicator. And like I said, the basilic vein is often untouched. In this patient, we ended up doing a, um, a brachiocephalic uh, fistula just because uh, I thought that it would just be a one-shot deal and then we'd be done. But it turned out that we had to superficialize it. She had a big fat arm. So we could have used the basilic vein, which is a bigger vein, and, uh, but e either way. Dr. Unger. One that I made a mistake on. Uh, this is a venogram that I performed. Yeah. Question. You, is there any is there any, any place for non-invasive imaging, like MR venogram or CT venogram? Or do you just like or do you just do it pre-op? Yes. Uh, CT venogram and MR venogram, I, I'll, I'll address later. But those, I think, are better for addressing the central vasculature. So I, I would think that, like, let's say you have a patient in the office that said, uh, well, you know, I've had 15 different operations on each arm and none of them worked. Then the first thing you'd want to do is, uh, well, you could, you could do a venogram yourself, uh, but you probably should do a um, MR venogram or a CT venogram because that would evaluate the central vasculature. Because those, if somebody has a history of multiple fistulas that have failed or multiple grafts that have failed, a lot of the times it's because of central venous occlusion from prior dialysis catheters in the neck going through the uh, SVC. So okay. One thing um, for, well, I'll, I'll get to uh, MRVs later. But, uh, does that uh, address the question you had? Or? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Okay, so this is a mistake that I made. I did this uh, venogram on this guy. Um, this is a first, he, he was a consult for putting in a, um, a dialysis catheter, and, uh, and, I, and we put in the dialysis catheter and do a venogram and fistulagram at the same time if we think this, the story is right. Um, so I, I thought that the cephalic vein in the forearm was not that good, but um, here it is in the upper arm, and it looked okay. Uh, and then we looked at it and we was like, oh, look at those valves on the cephalic vein, it's great. But, um, you know, if you look at the central veins, these are the, the brachial veins that are supposed to be next to the basilic vein, and they're pretty sclerotic. And this basilic vein right here is huge. Um, uh, or this could be also a, a brachial vein. I'm not sure what it is right now. But um, um, I should have known something was wrong. And then when I was looking at the ultrasound to map it out, uh, I thought something's not quite right, but you can see that in our operating room, this particular uh, operating room doesn't have the greatest technology. We're using a flora machine, and I didn't have the greatest ultrasound. And it turned out this vein was very sclerotic. The patient probably had thrombophlebitis before, uh, and I had to use coronary dilator to get it open. And um, we ended up leaving the OR with a good thrill in the fistula after creation, but um, it soon sclerosed after, and I had to do balloon angioplasties up and down to get it to work, and uh, we're still working on getting it to work. Um, so then I started doing all my venograms in the cath lab, which have much better imaging, and these are shrunk down. But um, this is another example. This is a patient who um, came in, and they had a catheter malfunction. The catheter was placed uh, several months ago from a different hospital, and it came in and wasn't working. I thought, maybe it has a fibrin sheet, so I'll, I'll fix it. And at the same time, she had never had a dialysis access, so I took the chance to do a venogram and plant it in the cath lab, and then I said, I'll go to the oper operating room later. So. Um, this is her left arm, which is what we started off because she's right-handed. Uh, um, 
is we want her, when she's connected to the dialysis machine, to not to be able to move her dominant hand. So we always start with the left hand. And uh, this got a little blurry, but you can see there's, there were no cephalic vein, no basilic vein, but there are two paired venae commentante of the uh, basilic, I'm sorry, the brachial uh, veins. And I ended up using one of these to make a two-stage brachial brachial fistula. You can see that essentially it's okay. Uh, we're in the process of, I was doing this while uh, the re resident was taking out the uh, frac uh, we cut this catheter right here to get access to the central veins uh, to, to then replace, and I, I ballooned open a fibrin sheath uh, and put a new catheter in, and then we were, this the tunnel cuff had incorporated, he was taking it out while I was doing the venogram. You can see on the right arm, it's all sclerotic here. There's some real big problem, like no central vein plate up here, uh, but it's patent here. So this patient could have a graft where you hook the graft up to the artery over here and connect it to the vein. Uh, up in the axilla, but um, anyway, uh, we, we were trying for a fistula first. Uh, and then even if you don't see it on a venogram, sometimes a brachial vein shows up on a duplex. This is a, a, a good uh, way of evaluating fistula after it's created. So by six weeks, if you see the patient in the office, you should see it, you can tell if it would mature or not. Or, you know, you might get sent from interventional radiology a patient who uh, surgeon's done a, a, a fistula access, but it's not good enough where they say they can't access it, so they may send it to you to evaluate. If you look at it, uh, this is the rule of six. It should take six weeks to know whether it's mature or not. Uh, blood flow should be greater than 600 mils per minute uh, if you did a um, flow characteristics on duplex or some other measurement, uh, although one liter is probably the magic number for a, an easily consistent access. The diameter's got to be greater than six millimeters and eight millimeters, probably the balloon number that we try to balloon it to if we have to. This one's pretty consistent, length of about six centimeters because you want to have the needles placed far apart so they don't have recirculation. Uh, and the depth has to be uh, less than 0.6 centimeters. I think this one's a little, a bit of a stretch to make it a roll of six, but you don't want it to be too deep. Uh, and this is from KDOKU guidelines. Uh, for ones that are consistently hard to access, there's this, this is just worth mentioning. You might see this on a patient and not know what it is, but a buttonhole technique is, is a technique of repeatedly 10 times accessing the fish in the same place, and it develops an epithelialized tract. And then this is a sharp needle that they usually use. If once you've created a buttonhole, you can use this dull needle to get in there, uh, and this is reported as, um, you know, more op optimal for maintenance of this uh, fistula and, and helpful in patients with limited fistula length as well. Um, all right, here we go. Here's a case of a, of a dial. I, I thought I was going on too much for fistula creation, so um, I thought maybe I would throw in an arteriogram here or a fistulogram. Uh, this is an 85-year-old male who underwent a left upper extremity basilic vein transposition. And, and in an 85-year-old, sometimes we try to do the basilic vein transposition in one shot. We don't do it in two stages like, like I was describing. Uh, and here he is in October, so several months after. And he's got a thrill, but it's pulsatile, uh, and it's not mature. The thrill's not that strong. So here's um, the basilic vein as it gets, uh, goes into the deep system, as it joins the paired veins associated with the brachial artery. Um, and oftentimes we see right at the distal, I'm sorry, the proximal dissection point, there's some stenosis for some reason. I don't know why. Um, so this is the fistulogram. We uh, crossed it. Um, this is a seven millimeter balloon that you can see it's wasting there. So we know that that's uh, a problem. Uh, and then I used a six millimeter cutting balloon to burst the uh, band or whatever it was and then ballooned it up. This is a seven millimeter balloon again, so you can see it comes to profile. Uh, and it's much improved. Okay, but somebody might say, wait a second, look at this uh, pseudoaneurysm there. That, uh, this, I'm really nervous about that. Let's put a covered stent over it. And my goal for this talk is to say never put a covered stent in a fistula, um, unless certain scenarios. Here is, I was looking at pseudoaneurysm up on the web on like pseudoaneurysms. Uh, in fistulas, and I got this picture. And this was almost an example of what not to do, only the person had put it on there, I hope they're not watching this talk, uh, was listing this as a good case example. Um, so they did this uh, fistulogram, and they noted that this patient had um, a covered stent already. 
but there are all these fistulas and they're in the dialysis nurses are not able to even access this. So uh, this is the reflux view. Uh, and in order to do a reflux view on a, on a fistula, you put a needle in. And if you normally inject it, it would go in the direction of blood flow in the vein. But if you, so you have to block off the vein with your hand or with your with a instrument and shoot contrast in, and then it goes backwards into the artery there. So that that looks adequate. There's good adequate. Probably had a good pulse to it. Uh, but all these um, serums. So then uh, they put in covered stents uh, right here. So this is now essentially turning this fistula into a graft right now which we, we talked about the negatives of a graft, which tend to get infected. Plus, not only does it have prosthetic material that can tend to get infected, but now it's also being surrounded by uh, a hematoma and a pseudoaneurysm, which is protein-rich, and bacteria really love that medium. So uh, then at the, at the bottom of this uh, um, uh, vignette, he said, oh, it looks great afterwards. But at the bottom, he's like, the patient has not been back. I expect a venous aplo may need tweaking. Uh, I, I think the patient got admitted to another hospital with an effusion infection, and then uh, they had to abandon it. That's what I, that's my philosophy on these is not to put these in. And you have a lot of patients who um, get dialysis access, and then, and the dialysis centers have uh, deals made with, low, with outpatient dialysis access centers. The patients will get sent there without the surgeon knowing, and, um, and stuff will happen to the fish, uh, and, you know, I as a surgeon have no idea what's going on. So, um, you know, the system's really not that good for um, really good communication, unfortunately. Uh, here's another case study. This is a patient that we had who uh, also had the same problem. Um, they presented with, this is not the patient, but they presented with something that looked like this, and we were like, this looks horrible. Infected pseudonyms, and what's going on? And, we, and they had said that they had gone to an outpatient dialysis center, so we got an x-ray, and that pseudoaneurysm was right over this covered stent right there. Um, we ended up, uh, and in this case, it was all infected. The only thing to do was ligate it. Uh, so this is the guy. We ended up taking out the stent and that piece of vein. Uh, this is a kind of a good story because this was thrombose, but we came back uh, two to three weeks later, and we were able to perform an embolectomy of this native vein. It was a huge fistula before. Uh, and then we did the same over here, embolectomy, did an embolectomy, and we moved the vein distally, detached it from the artery, connected it back here, and then restarted the fistula. Uh, and the problem is that the pseudoaneurysm developed because he had a blockage here, and we, and we ballooned the blockage at the same time. Um, and here, I'm going to give a shout out to uh, the interventional radiology guys at Duke University uh, who um, uh, I worked with in fellowship. Uh, and these, they, they, uh, sh they did a retrospective analysis and showed that um, uh, stent placement in grafts um, is 16% uh, of them require excision due to uh, infection. Um, and uh, I, don't, I didn't put the te the uh, numbers here right, but uh, I think the number was 30% of time. If you, if they deployed it in the stickable part of the graph where the dialysis guys are accessing it, 30% of those get infected compared to 7%. Um, and th this did not include fistulas, but uh, when should you put in a covered stent? Uh, people describe that if there's um, the cephalic vein as it goes up to the deltoid and comes down into the uh, central veins, um, that can be a point where that becomes recurrent stenosis that get balloon, 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 and then some people say to put in covered stents there. Uh, covered stents because they think the process is um, neointimal hyperplasia, uh, but um, you know uh, if you put in a non-covered stent, that process will just grow back through the stent, so they say to put in a covered stent. Um, or in uh, central venous uh, uh, re stenosis to put in stents, but I, um, and I think that if you're going to put in a stent and it's in the stickable portion of the fistula, only do it if the patient's about to die and you, they're, you're going to bleed out otherwise. I, I've had a lot of uh, fistula grants where I've ballooned it and they have a, the fistula uh, hones up, as they say in North Carolina, or, you know, gets bigger, uh, grows big, you can see the blood pulling there, but if you hold pressure there for a couple of minutes and wrap it afterwards, it, it uh, thromboses and uh, is fine. So, 
Um, but if you put in a stent, it's like giving them a permanent disease uh, as opposed to um, you can't take it out uh, except for operatively. Uh, and they also say that uh, you can put a cover stent in um, graft venous stenosis. And I, I don't think I mentioned this anywhere in the talk, so I'll say that like, if you have a graft, uh, which is a piece of plastic, and it's connected to a vein, the area that it develops stenosis is right where that piece of plastic is touching a vein. A vein is very flimsy and vibrates, and the piece of plastic vibrates at a different frequency. And that's where, right at that interface, is where the stenosis develops. Um, it usually develops a year to year and a half after placement. So, but they say if you put a if you put a stent in there, uh, that 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 is a good a good place to put it, or that's an acceptable place to put in a stent because uh, it's not stickable. Um, and then uh, I sort of skipped around, but this is for preoperative analysis for for fistula placement. Uh, there are several patients. Uh, this uh, Dr. Mendez um, trained me when I was in general surgery, uh, and he did a study that retrospectively looked at it and he said that. Uh, a, a official is more prone to, to mature if the vein is greater than two millimeters. That's what he said. Other people say 1.5 millimeters has to be more than 1.5 millimeters for arterial uh, as well. Uh, and then the other thing that you can, can get on a non-invasive workup, you know, I was talking about doing venograms and measuring the central venous occlusion, is that you can also catch that on a venogram, which is that if the patient has a respiratory, uh, they have respiratory variation of the uh, axillary and subclavian uh, veins. Uh, that's a sign that there is no obstruction. If the patient takes a deep breath in and the waveform does not change, that would be an indication that the uh, central veins are, are obstructed to some degree. Um, okay, and then grafts. We don't like grafts, but we have to talk about them anyway. There's multiple ones. You can connect the artery to the, and the forearm to the vein. That one I don't think would work that well because this, uh, I haven't seen too many of these, uh, because the inflow, the artery, is not really strong enough to handle. The, the grafts are more prone to, thr to thrombosing because they're not lined with endothelium, uh, and the body wants to thrombose against them, so you have, really have to have high blood flow to prevent it. Um, I've, the forearm loop works. You can then, if this gets infected, you can come back and flip it up this way. If that gets infected, come back, uh, connect the artery this way, a rainbow graft or an upper axillary loop graft. Those are all, you can keep marching the way up uh, if you want. Um, here are some types of grafts that are interesting, I think. Uh, PTFE uh, or Gore-Tex Gore or, you know, Atrium makes it also. Uh, that's like considered the standard of care. It's, it's relatively cheap for one thing, but all the companies are now um, making um, these lined with heparin and uh, my, what I was taught as a fellow was that uh, the heparin is gone within two weeks. So I, I don't know if it really makes a difference between the heparin or not. Um, you can make them out of da you can put a graft out of Dacron, but they say that Dacron Dacron's uh, more of a weave. It's not a uniform uh, piece of material, uh, and it's usually um, has ridges in it. So it's really more difficult to cannulate, and then to perform a thrombectomy is difficult because you can see this is PTFE right here. It's smooth on the inside, and a Dacron has ridges, so it's, it's harder to run the balloon through. Uh, and then there's modified uh, PTFE. Um, this is the Gore Hybrid, which I'll show later, but it's a it's a regular PTFE, and on the end, it's attached to a stent that can be deployed. Um, and then there's the AccuSeal and the Flixine, and both of these are made out of fancy materials so that if you stick a needle in it and pull it out, the needle will, the uh, hole will um, close up more rapidly than a standard PTFE. Because I was saying before, you have to wait two to three weeks before the tissue ingrows to the graft in order to stick it. Um, so these are, are um, new ones that we've used uh, and with varying success. If a patient has infection after infection after infection of grafts, there's, uh, you can use um, uh, material that in, in, in theory not as much as a prosthetic and they uh, can t take a carotid, bovine carotid or mesenteric vein and Procol is uh, bovine mesenteric vein and, and make a graft out of that. Cryovane is uh, a company named Cryolife who makes a, takes um, uh, cadaver veins and tans them so that you can implant them in other, and they kind of wash them to get rid of the ABOs and all other immunogenic type material, and then you can implant them. So it's like a collagen tube uh, that's been made out of formaldehyde. 
Uh, I, I'm not so sure these work that great, uh, but um, they say that in like if you had to reconstruct a, a graft in the middle of infection, use a use a cadaver femoral vein might work. Uh, and then these two companies, Humocyte and Cytograft, are two companies that are artificially growing tubes out of collagen, out of human collagen. In and uh, my mentor and and uh, fellowship uh, did a lot of the research for Humocyte. Uh, that's coming down. That's going to be new uh, in the next five years, I'd say. Uh, and here's a picture of the Gore hybrid and how it works. That's the one that had the PTFE graft connected to a stent. Uh, and you can use it by, like this. And the company would say, you know, oh, it's, it's easier to make a uh, graft this way. You don't have to make an anastomosis. You just have to stick a needle into the vein and open this into it, and it'll work. Uh, and, and we found that that's, you know, maybe not that much of an advantage. Plus, it's a lot of fun to sew a, a, a graft into a vein. Um, but, like, let's say, for instance, you had so much uh, occlusion from prior stents that you, the only thing you could access was the, the axillary vein, and you're really going up there right in the axilla. You can't really get a, a clamp around it. Maybe that's the time to use this kind of thing where you can stick a needle into the vein where you can see and just deploy, make your distal anastomosis into something that you could really have trouble uh, clamping before. And that, this is the stent once it's deployed, you can see it flowing through there in this, this graph, or this picture. Uh, then there's some exotic graphs that you can do. Uh, the necklace graft from the axillary artery to the axillary vein. The, the axillary artery and vein are both very difficult to expose, but uh, uh, the brachial artery to the jugular vein, that's a weird one. Thigh veins, actually, um, the group in Norfolk, Virginia, uh, has published a lot of data saying that they would do this before they do a hero, which I'll talk about next. Um, they say they have better uh, patency and less infection rates if they do it in the thigh. You can even do a graft out here in the thigh, which is, in theory, less likely to get infected compared to one in the groin. Um, here's a hero. Um, hero stands for hemodialysis reliable outflow graft. Um, and it has two components. It's got this component, which is a nitinol stent. And this is for people who have blockage in their central veins, which would be like right here. Uh, so um, you put this in just like a central line, and it's a six millimeter, and it's a night and all covered by silicone, I think. And you put the tip of it right in the um, right ventricle. So you, you don't have the problem of uh, central venous occlusion. Uh, and you connect it to a PTFE. You, Hero comes with its own PAT fee, but if you wanted to connect this to one of those ones that I, I was mentioning, which can self-seal rapidly, you can install a Hero and use it the same day if you use the core AccuSeal. Um, so that's a Hero, and I, I have a case for this one. Uh, here we go. Okay, here's a here's a patient who um, was from Key West. We get a lot of patients flown in from Key West in Miami Beach, um, and somebody in Key West did a uh, a fistula, a left arm. Uh, I, I think this is a, um, yeah, this was a first stage basilic vein. So the plan was to come back after connecting it, let it mature, and then superficialize the basilic vein. But she had terrible swelling in her, in her arm. Uh, and for some reason, they also put a, uh, a line in her left neck. Uh, and, and I should just editorialize and say that lines in the left neck uh, are supposed to be more uh, they, they cause central venous stenosis. So you, you can imagine this is in contact with the central veins much more and putting pressure on the walls compared to one that was in the right IJ. So uh, when I looked at this, I saw this, I thought, like, oh, he's got, she's got stenosis because, um, or she's got occlusion because of this, this, uh, this dialysis catheter. So, and this is the reflex view, which I could not perform because um, she has so many collaterals that I couldn't really occlude it enough to get the blood to flow back into the artery. But she had a great pulse, so I said, that's fine. So I said, okay, we're going to have to take this, eventually to take out this line. So I, I did a venogram of her left uh, leg, because she had had lots of lines before, uh, and that was patent. So I put in a um, dialysis catheter there. Uh, and I made a mistake here. I should have left my access there and done this at the end. But um, here is when I took a shot. I, so I cut down right here on the access point, right where it goes into the jugular vein, and I put a wire through the through this um, catheter. I pull the catheter out and then put a sheath in 
uh, and then shot a uh, venogram. And you could see that where the catheter had been was uh, either the whole vein had occluded or that's a fibrin sheath around it. I don't know which it is. Um, I actually think it's a central vein occlusion already. So then I balloon it, balloon it, balloon it more. And it looks better. Um, it's open, but this is still pretty stenosed. Um, and then I took a picture. Now I'm, I wanted to see, okay, I've gotten this open. How does it look now that I shoot from the arm? And it looked like this. So all the blood going into got right to that uh, where it would join the jugular and then stopped. Um, so I said, uh-oh. Well, I blew in that, fixed it. Uh, and then I, um, I brought up a six French sheath, long sheath, with its tip right there, and I put the wire and catheter. I tried to get across this. Um, and my, my read on this was pretty chronic. I didn't think I was going to be able to get across. Uh, there's the collaterals before it can join into the jugular vein. My criteria for stopping is when I stick a catheter into the mediastinum. So this is a uh, contrast just going to the mediastinum. I kind of stop at that point. And I didn't think I, now I, and if I had left my, if I hadn't put in a, a tunnel dialysis line here, I could have um, come back up through the groin all the way up to here and try to cross over from the other side, which I'll show in a later case. Um, but uh, I didn't do that. And we just decided we would convert this to a hero. So what we did is, we had to superficialize the, uh, the fistula anyway, so superficialize it and connected its outflow into a hero, and the arm swelling went away once we did that. And where they're sticking her, even though she has a piece of prosthetic in her, in her body, where they're sticking her uh, fistula is actually a piece of her own vein. So true that. Uh, I'm going to skip steel right now, but just talk a little bit about vascular access complications. This is a guy that we saw in the office who had high outflow, outflow cardiac failure. And you can see some patients have uh, such a good fistula that if, if it's greater than two liters, it can cause congestive heart failure. And um, usually a sign of that is the aneurysmal degradation because there's so much flow through it. Uh, that's a sign that they, the patient's going to develop uh, high output cardiac outflow. And we, we've taken the philosophy of, of um, performing uh, fistulaplasties of these and uh, there's one guy in the area who champions doing that in order to prevent development of congestive heart failure. But there can also be bleeding, uh, pseudoaneurysms, which you talked about, infections we talked about. Weeping syndrome is one that only happens with uh, grafts, which is when you first put in a graft, the graft acts as like a filter, and so some of the fluid in the blood weeps out of the graft, but all the proteins stay inside, uh, and that can be pretty bad. Uh, some people advocate taking the patient back, washing it out, replacing the, that with a different type of PTFE. Uh, the, where it's weeping. Uh, other people report putting stents in the proximal portion of the, I'm sorry, in the, in the part that's weeping, putting stents across it. Um, and other people just say ligate it. Uh, and then there's also, if you read about vascular access in the book, they talk about having neuropathy from uh, not related to messing with the nerve when you do the surgery, but just the change in the blood flow effects in there. I've never seen that, uh, but it's described. Okay, so that's surgical creation. Uh, does anybody have any questions at this point? Oh, somebody put in the, uh, oh, cool. The, somebody put in the, uh, the, the actual numbers for the infection for that, that paper. Okay, great. Okay. Keep going. Okay, uh, endovascular intervention. Um, Here's my op interventional strategy. I've shown some of these, but uh, whenever somebody comes in with a fistula that's not working, it usually ends up being sort of like a throwdown, like two, two hours worth of work. Uh, and it's just hard to access both the arterial side and the venous side of the fistula. So here you can see one of the setups where it's accessed in two different directions with different uh, sheets. Usually I use a six French sheet both sides, but uh, I used to do it where I started with a four French access because my theory was putting a needle hole into a uh, high flow vascular system, I try to use the smallest. And in order to do a four French access, which is this one right here, um, you, the sterling balloons uh, are the thinnest ones. And you can get an eight millimeter balloon through a four French access, and you have to use a very uh, uh, narrow wire, the Spartacore wire. Um, um, so that's, uh, that's that strategy. But then if you decide you want to use a cutting balloon, 
you have to use a six French access. Um, and I use uh, over a Sparta cord, which is again a uh, small caliber wire using uh, Boston Scientific cutting balloon, and I use six to eight millimeters. Also, the barred vasky track comes fits through the same sheath, uh, and also uses a Sparta cord or other small uh, wire. Then, if you want to use stronger uh, balloons and wires, uh, you can switch to an 035 inch wire uh, and use like a a charger, which is a Boston Scientific balloon, which to a six to eight millimeter balloon, or um, an Atlas or Dorado for bigger ones. These balloons, these balloons have uh, Kevlar, and they're stronger than the charger balloons, which are uh, so. Anyway, um, they say uh, that, you, like I was saying, you want to have eight millimeter balloon as your final balloon, but you can't. Sometimes can't go from a small fistula. To right to eight millimeters, so you kind of balloon to six millimeters one session, and then come back later if it doesn't work, and do eight millimeters. And centrally, up in the in the shoulder, you want to start thinking about doing eight, ten, and twelve millimeter millimeter balloons as, at that point. Um, and then when I was talking about doing central venous occlusions and and crossing over those, uh, take a six French destination or eight French long sheath to get a lot of because uh, to cross those chronic occlusions, you really need a lot of backbone on your sheath. Uh, in order to do that. And you could see here, this is our setup where this is the person's left arm. Their body's here, so all the wires are going across the body, and the eye is going over top. It can often be very awkward to do these cases when com compared to like a leg case. Um, and I had to thank uh, some people who gave me some rules for doing this. Uh, this guy, Dr. Tabar, I talked to him actually tonight. Um, he's at University of Miami, and I took care of one of his patients early in my career, and I called him up. I said, I'm thinking about doing a fistulogram. She's complaining of pain, and she might have steel. And he said, okay, sure. And he gave me some, like, quick rules, which said, if you're doing a fistulogram, just make sure you take pressure measurements, uh, and you can really figure out where the blockage is if you see a drop in pressure or a rise in pressure. And he told me that he likes to have the map of fi less than 50 at the fistula if you measure the pressure there. Uh, and I've used his rules, that, that like simple five-minute conversation with him in their early career. Like I use those same rules, and it's really uh, been really successful. Um, and when I and these are the guys at uh, Duke who trained me, Dr. Lawson, who did the research in the college and that that company I was talking about. Dr. Kim is really an expert on MR venograms, CT venograms, and he's interventional radiology. He does a lot of crossing uh, of chronic uh, central occlusions. And he will then leave a central line in it, and Dr. Lawson would then put it, convert it to a hero. And Dr. Cox is the peripheral uh, endovascular guy in vascular surgery and taught me a lot of how I, all the techniques. So I have to thank all these guys. Dr. Tabara told me to mention Julianne. Does anyone you know Julianne? He's uh, in private practice in Miami. He said that he, he was the interventional radiologist who taught him all the rules. And I, I used to be afraid of using a cutting balloon in a fistula early on in my uh, career from my training, but now now I use it like almost every case, and they really work great. It doesn't seem like it damages. Uh, and again, stay calm if there's a pseudoaneurysm. Just hold pressure before dropping a stent. Uh, okay, so um, I talked about a little bit about um, before about a fistula that wasn't maturing, kind of giving it a push to let it mature. And here's a uh, area which is a fistula that's been in, working for a while it'll stop working perfectly, and the dialysis staff might report that there's elevated venous pressures, like on the, uh, that machine that I was showing you before. Um, and that would indicate central venous hypertension, which can develop in any fish flow over time. Um, and if there's elevated arterial pressure, um, which means like the machine is sucking in the, and it becomes more and more negative, that might mean that there's inadequate inflow causing uh, a vacuum in there. Uh, and then recirculation we were also talking about earlier for venous hypertension. If you feel, if they send you a fistula that has problems, they say it's problems, you want to feel to see if it's pulsatile. Because if you have a good fistula without any central occlusion, it will have a vibration. It will have a thrill and a brewery. Uh, a lot of people mess up these two in training. Uh, a thrill is something you can feel, and a brewery is something you can hear. Um, but uh, if, you, if you notice that it's not got a continuous thrill uh, or it's really pulsatile, that's an indicator that it's a problem with venous hypertension. So, and they all develop some degree of it. 
here's a case. Uh, let me remember this case. Okay, this patient presented. He'd had a fistula for several years. Uh, you can see that he's got multiple interventions. We knew he had a central venous stent. It was not placed by our, uh, it was at an outpatient place. Um, and his arm became swollen. So uh, I took a picture of this. I didn't quite know what was really the problem. I kind of suspected there might be a problem right here, but um, I didn't know. And I ended up putting in blood pressure measurements, and we are able to, to solve where the blockages were. Um, and he, here's where it was, and this is us. Uh, the catheter and then pulling this back, you just measure the pressures and look at the waveforms. And there was a big uh, pressure gradient between here and here, which you can see here in more detail. But there was also pressure gradients all, all throughout the stent. Uh, so you could see us ballooning that area right there. Even a small balloon wastes. That balloon comes to profile. And here's the wasting of that balloon uh, right at that stenosis. This is really hard. Like I ballooned it to there with a, a regular balloon. It came to profile. This is a cutting balloon. I think that's an eight millimeter cutting balloon. That's the biggest one cutting balloon you can have uh, that I know of, at least. Um, and, and it still didn't look perfect, and pressure measurements didn't make it perfect, so I kept ballooning with bigger and bigger ones. And here I tried to make my own cutting balloon by taking a huge balloon and putting uh, two glide wires next to it. Um, it sort of worked. You could see there it looked better. Uh, I still couldn't come to profile, but it looked much better, actually, at the end. And then when I actually took a, I, I couldn't tell, am I done or not? So I, I measured pressure across, and it actually, uh, let's see. And then um, put in a little bit more up in that area of stenosis. This is the final product. Uh, it, the, the fissure itself had a pulsatile aspect to it before that was decreased at the end of the intervention. That's always like a very subjective thing to say. Um, some of the guys I know do ultrasounds um, duplex before and after their intervention and really characterize it. But uh, we don't have that yet in Mount Sinai. But here, here's how I knew I was done. I measured pressures from the right heart all the way through this fistula to the distal fistula. And you can see here that uh, when I, we started, the pressure at the fistula was 95 over 35 with a mean of 58, but then afterwards it was 60 over 35 with a mean of 45. And you could see here at pre-op, if you, um, from the stent to the brachiocephalic right there, uh, it had a little bit of a, a bit of brachiocephalic there. If you did a little, little bit of that, a little bit of pressure gradient while I was ballooning it. But here between the Brachiocephalic and the um, proximal and distal, it was a big drop off, right where it was on. And and after the intervention, you could see, even though I couldn't co get the balloon profile, it, it really had no no pressure gradient. So I felt like that was a good. And I, I probably could have even ballooned even more here to get rid of these pressure gradients. But I said we're less than 50. Well, let's stop for now. It seemed like a lot. It was it had reached the two hour mark, so we stopped. Let's see. Uh, all right. It's almost uh, 10 o'clock. I'm going to try to go quickly through this. Uh, this is just uh, somebody, it's a it's similar thing. Uh, some, this was a better success story than before. She had a fistula. She had had, she, she's from the Virgin Islands. That's another patient that we have in Miami. People who come from the Virgin Islands have to fly to Miami to get medical treatment. So they, this patient had had this in for one year, this uh, tunnel dialysis catheter. Again, the left IJ, which tends to cause occlusions. And her fistula just wasn't working, we found. That. So I, I, again, cut down right there, uh, put a sheath in there instead of and when I took out the distal part of the catheter. So this part of the catheter still attached to the patient. Uh, put a wire in from both places so I wouldn't lose access across central vein. It went pretty easily uh, and ballooned it. And it was wide open, big win. And uh, we, we worked for a while on this patient, like doing multiple other fistulograms before it finally worked, and she finally worked. And there were a lot of pseudoaneurysms before it finally worked, but it, if she's now have no catheter and she's getting fistula, and that we think will prolong her life. Central venous obstruction, um, why does it happen? That's the ones we were talking about. Prosthetic material in contact with a wall. Uh, and I was saying the left IJ is worse than the right IJ. And patients, some, sometimes you come in and somebody from the outside hospital has put in a subclavian dialysis catheter, which is horrible because 
they're associated with a 50% incidence of stenosis, so only the IJ. Uh, and um, let's say you have a catheter in, and on the same arm you have a fistula. They say that the turbulence and vibration from that can also cause increase, and that's the, both cases that we saw with central venous occlusion had a fistula on, one, on the same side that the catheter was in. But, you know, if you feel like your fistula is going to be mature in the next uh, three months, it's okay to do that. Uh, and I actually started venogramming everybody who's had a, these kind of situations to make sure they don't have stenosis when I'm taking out their catheter when they're working fistula. And we talked about the uh, diagnosis of central venous occlusion, which is best with CT venogram and MR venogram. Uh, the guys at Duke use MR venogram as their main study of choice, but they, you know, for the risk of nephrogenic uh, fibrosing uh, dermatitis with, um, I'm saying that wrong, uh, but with the, uh, with the current MR contrast, uh, you're not supposed to really use it in dialysis patients anyway. So uh, ferrohem was the iron-based um, uh, contrast agent that they use, but it's very expensive and it's not available at every institution. So, um, and then somebody also mentioned Ablavar, Ablavar as another alternative that we're thinking about getting here so, as another contrast agent. I'm going to skip through this central venous. I think we've done enough of this. But this one, uh, I will show just one part of it. This patient has central venous obstruction. She had a working fistula, and it was painful. So, um, and they, they had been at uh, another place where they tried to cross it, but they couldn't, and they said, uh, maybe try with better sedation at Mount Sinai. So we, we tried, and uh, I tried uh, for a couple minutes to get across centrally, but I couldn't. Uh, so I came up from the groin with this catheter and a long sheath. It was a six French destination sheath uh, with my wire right there. And it was actually relatively easy to get this wire and catheter across the occlusion so that I, I knew I was in the right vein when I injected with this catheter and got the same venogram as before. Put a wire there and snared that uh, wire and pulled it out the arm. So this is the so-called uh, body floss technique where you have a wire going into the groin, going all the way through to the patient's fistula or neck or whatever, body floss. Uh, and we ballooned it, but uh, using pressure measurements, I just uh, I kept, I, I couldn't get this pressure to drop off despite all ballooning. So I did put in, um, uh, I ended up taking a picture to know where I should drop it, but I tried to drop a stent in right across there so that I wouldn't get into the, uh, main superior vena cava, and there's my stent. It's a 14, uh, the biggest one I could find, which was a 14 um, Luminex stent. Wall stent is the other one that people use. Um, I've had not the greatest results with wall stents before, but they, they do work. Uh, and I ballooned it, ballooned it again, and then pressure measurements across this dropped off, so there's no pressure measurement uh, on this across this stent. Uh, and it's not the greatest venogram, but the collaterals were still there, but they didn't fill as much as before. Um, keep going, ballooned everywhere on this person. This patient, they couldn't dialyze her because the venous pressures were too high. But after all this ballooning everywhere, um, her fistula pressure mean dropped from 86 to 70. And it was le this is more than the 50 number that I was talking about, but um, her central pressure was 25, so I figured most people's central pressure is much less than that. So if we dialyzed her and got fluid off that this pressure, and clinically it felt better after all the interventions, didn't feel as pulsatile, and they were able to dialyze her after we did this. Um, and then just a concept to be uh, familiar with is balloon-assisted maturation. Um, and these are uh, surgeons and interventional radiologists in uh, New York, uh, and they talk about the concept of um, trying to get a forearm fistula by using smaller veins than normally. We, I usually end up with all the older patients that are in Miami Beach trying to usually doing upper arm fistulas, but these guys really try to work to get forearm fistulas, and they would balloon it at the time of placement to four millimeters, and then they had planned serial fistulograms uh, all the way up to uh, 8 millimeters by 6 weeks, and they report an 85% maturation rate, which is better than the 50% maturation rate that I quoted before. Um, all right. Uh, I think that that is, um, what do you think, enough for the 
Friendly. Okay. I, I really don't have that much more. Just um, the one uh, last slide that I had. Um, this is vascular access monitoring. Just the the, the various things that I've sort of hinted at when we were talking about it before, but this is supposed to be like a list where they can check off in the dialysis unit of things to, when they notice in the dialysis unit, they should send it back to interventionist or surgeon. Um, graft D clots. I had a bunch of it, I have had a bunch of these that I've done, but I, I uh, ran out of time to put all the pictures in. But the main strategy for graft D clots, and this is more common done with uh, grafts than with fistula but uh, because they tend to clot off more. Fistulas just tend to kind of putter out slowly, uh, whereas grafts tend to be fine all of a sudden and then all of a sudden occlude. Um, and the concept is to access both on the arterial side and the venous side and set yourself up uh, and to put a wire through. You put a wire through and you verify that you're in each vessel. But you really have to be careful with these because if you inject contrast right here, in the artery, you can blow blow uh, um, you can blow a clot into the artery, and that's considered bad. Uh, and I've done it before on the last deep clot that I had to cut down on this uh, artery and pull the clot out. It was really kind of unfortunate, um, and I did it in the cath lab too, which is uh, under under local anesthesia. It was kind of great. Uh, anyway. Um, Catheter over wires are great, and they have the Fogarty embolectomy balloons you might have seen uh, before that you can put over wire that work very well for this. And what you do first is lace this with TPA, um, and then uh, push and pull, and you essentially take the clot and throw it to the lungs. Um, I don't know. There's some data that says if you do a bunch of these, the patient have higher pulmonary pressures, but uh, usually they can tolerate it once or twice easily. This shows using an infusion catheter. I haven't seen that technique, but I, I've done um, done the uh, push pull and the TPA. And if it's a, if it's a graft, I usually tend to um, uh, try to do some hybrid combination where I cut this open, pull out the majority of the clot, and then close it up and get flow reestablished, and then use uh, interventional techniques to perfect it or balloon it uh, open. The other thing is uh, doing this on fistulas. Uh, some people say that if a fistula clots, you should just leave it alone. But you know, you can actually do the same technique on a fistula. That and uh, uh, I did one the other day. I didn't think it was going to work, but I was really surprised it worked. So I'm going to start doing it on a, all of the ones that I get from now on. Um, I think that's about it for uh, for my talk. Um, I hope. Let's see. I'm going to the questions here. Um, Thank you guys very much for, for letting me uh, give this talk. I hope it was informative and not too boring. But, uh, let's see. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Unger. And you had some good jokes in there, too, uh, especially about that. Oh, good. I'm sure that <laughs> we were, I was laughing. I can't speak for everyone, but, uh, but yeah, okay. thanks. I try. <laughs> Not the greatest ambition. Uh, should I go look through these questions here for a second? Yeah, do you see a couple of them? I'll, I'll, I'll let you. Yep. How would you suggest one minute? Yeah. Would you recommend surgical repair and graft interposition and all? Uh, for pseudoaneurysms if it, or um, aneurysmal degradation, what we've been doing is taking them to the OR and resecting uh, that portion that's bad, and then usually you can mobilize enough length to uh, fix them end to end. Um, and then in doing that, if you make the incision small enough, that you can still access parts of the fistula without that. Uh, pseudoaneurysms in grafts, um, you just avoid that area, and if it's big enough, uh, you can fix it by uh, either routing a new graft around it uh, or sometimes just repairing it. But I, I've never seen that routing, uh, I've never seen the repair pseudoaneurysm in a graft, um, or at least in my training, I didn't, we didn't do that. We mostly routed another graft around it, but in parallel, and then just tied off that portion of the graft. The PTFE, I mean, PTFE is a, uh, it's like styrofoam. That's what it is. It's like, and you can imagine like a, a styrofoam box, if you repeatedly put a needle through it, it's going to eventually degrade. And so after a year or two years, that PTFE will become needle holes in everywhere. And so it's sort of like beat up and you just replace it with a new one. Um, 
But fistula is we don't like to do graft interpositions and that's. Dr. Unger, can you talk about steel? What signs and symptoms you look for and how you manage it? Thank you, Brandon, uh, who's sitting next to me in the other <laughs> cubicle. Um, steel uh, is um, pain in the, in the hand. And they, they say that if you put in a fistula and all of a sudden they've got terrible pain in their hand and you can not feel a pulse anymore and don't have a good Doppler sign, a Doppler signal, then, you know, that's clinically steel. Um, and you should ligate it right away. But sometimes, you know, if you put in a fistula, it's a small vein and there's not a lot of flow going through it. Uh, but as it matures, there's more flow and the patient can develop steel a month into it as the fistula becomes more mature. Um, and the signs and symptoms are like if you're, the patient's getting dialysis and it hurts them when they're running the dialysis machine, if it hurts their hand, that's a good sign for steel because um, let me see if I have any more. No, my slide for steel wasn't that good. Um, so anyway, uh, if it hurts them when they're uh, running the dialysis, that's another sign for steel. The, the main thing, that, and you really try to treat it without doing much. You try to get them to move, do exercise with their hands before you think about intervening. The way that I would manage it to diagnose it would be to do a fistulogram uh, and sort of evaluate if there's any inflow problems, because steel can be caused by a more proximal arterial problem, you know, proximal to where the um, anastomosis comes off of. Uh, and and um, so a fistulogram, and then you put a uh, pulse ox on the finger, and if you can demonstrate that a waveform really changes drastically by when you occlude the fistula or the graft, then that's a diagnosis of steel as well. There's multiple ways of managing it. Um, let me see if I can, no, I don't want to do that. Yeah, let me find my, my steel. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get to it. Um, but there's ways of doing it. You can do a drill procedure, uh, D-R-I-L. Um, because the problem with steel is that the blood flow is flowing backwards in the artery, just distal to the anastomosis. So the artery, blood's going down the artery, into the vein, but then uh, all the collaterals that are feeding the hand, uh, that blood, blood flow is flowing backwards to some degree right before. So you want to tie off the artery um, right where the blood flow is backwards, but you have to do a bypass to the distal artery before doing that. Um, so that's distal revascularization, interval ligation. You tie off the artery just past the um, anastomosis. So. And then there's other ways to fix it. You can take a fistula and move it more proximal. So if it was in the break, the, if it was at the anticubal fossa, you could break, move it to the axillary artery. And the thought is that uh, moving it higher up will make it um, less likely to have steel clinically is what people have figured out. Okay, that's steel. Question. I don't know what the other questions are. <laughs> Do I? Question on follow-up. How regularly do you see your fistula patients for follow-up, and how regularly do you fistograms monitor for complications? Any patents data on main, maintaining patency with regular follow-ups? Uh, I don't think there's, not that I know of any like seminal papers, but uh, I think that for fistula patients, um, historically, you, you like, I think we see them once a year, and if they start having problems, you fix it and try to see it every three months and to make sure. Like if, if we've had an aneurysmal degradation and we fix fixed it, and balloon to pla balloon something, then everything might. So my new philosophy is that if I've done a plasty on a vein, uh, I want to monitor them every three months to make sure that that doesn't come back. And, uh, Tabara, the guy that I mentioned, um, he says that he sometimes schedules people for a re repeat fistulogram in three months after uh, a particular intervention. Just plain up schedule it just to look for it. Uh, but I don't know the data on that. Um, Okay, I think that's it. I think that's it for uh, questions. Is that? Thank you, Dr. Unger. Um, if any of you have any other questions, you can feel free to email me. Um, I can Dave or Brandon can get you my email, or I can give it to you now. It's c a n d a c e dot white w h i t e m s m c dot com. So email me with any questions, and I can pass them on to Dr. Unger. And thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. <laughs>